Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the latest, the official podcast of the Brock Press, where we take you beyond the headlines and deep dive into some of the many interesting articles written by our team this week. My name is Noah Nickel. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Brock Press, host of the latest, and today I'm joined by our managing editor, Holly Morset, and our editor-at-large, Jonah Dayton. How are you both doing today? I'm doing good. Uh, more well-rested than I think you are. I also have my eight hours of sleep, unlike you, Noah, so uh, you know, forgive him if he's a little groggy. Yeah, with the, with the election, um, definitely occupied mo- more of my time than sleep yesterday, but doing all right. Got a big, big coffee next to me, so hopefully I'll be able to push through. So Monday was election day. Uh, not the best timing for us here at the Brock Press, but made it work. I had a very, very long night, as they uh, alluded to, my, my lovely co-host alluded to earlier, but I'm hanging in there. Uh, the only issue, I would say, is that the election wasn't necessarily even worth watching either, which, you know, I can't blame anyone for missing this one. Uh, definitely, definitely a snooze fest coming in. Uh, for those unaware... The results pretty much mirrored the 2019 election, uh, kind of cemented the idea that many people had that this was entirely unnecessary. Um, pretty much everyone, save for uh, Justin Trudeau, felt that way. Uh, but, you know, they were able to scrape by with a few additional seats, which I'm sure they're happy with. Uh, and now really the their eyes are on the prize for another 18 months from now to have, to have another election. So uh, with that, I want to turn it to the lesser far lesser uh, politically engaged and interested co-hosts of mine uh, for their thoughts on on the election. So did you guys uh, did you guys end up voting? I think is my first uh, key question. I'm like tempted to say no just to like see what you would do. Because uh, <laughs> every year that I've worked with Noah, I've all of us have gotten a text that's just like, hey, are you guys going to vote? You should make sure to vote. Um, and it's wonderful because I did forget that the election was yesterday, but I did end up voting. It was fine. It was, you know, kind of a pain, but, you know, voted. Did my civic duty. Yeah, I, I had that Noah, like, my mom in the back of my head. Like, <laughs> if I didn't if I didn't vote, I'd, like, you'd never hear the end of it. But um, I, too, like Holly said, sort of voted and was, like, kind of meh about it. You know, it's it's not the most convenient, but it's also not the most inconvenient, which seems fitting given the election results. Yeah, I voted at like 3 p.m. and then I got home and I sat down and it was, I want to say like 9. And I opened up Twitter and I saw election coverage and I was like, oh yeah, I forgot the election was happening. And I voted like six hours earlier. Or they weren't waiting for your vote. You know, just call it. Definitely not. <laughs> Yeah, uh, to mention or to go off what you mentioned before, uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily the most exciting thing for me either uh, to vote, especially not this year. Um, but it kind of speaks to something for me that you know, voting is the smallest sliver of my political involvement compared to people like yourselves, where it's probably ninety percent of your <laughs> political engagement is just voting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 99%, probably more accurate, but it kind of reminds me, uh, so when I voted early, which I'd recommend everyone do. Because I did it last like, that again. I, I did the uh, early voting during the last election um, in 2019, and yeah, there were zero people there, and I cannot recommend it enough. I voted, like, normally, and there were still zero people there, so you know. Now, there were a horror stories of in, my, in the coverage I watched from CBC, they were talking about how in Toronto... Uh, there were waits that were two or three hours uh, this election time, so people were waiting after nine o'clock an additional uh, two, two and a half hours to vote, which, you know, I, I can respect them for, for doing it, I guess, but if I had waited that long to vote, right, like waited for the day of and went that late, and, you know, they were telling me I'd be waiting two or three hours, even me, I don't think I would wait for it, but that's because I wouldn't leave it that late, but yeah, that, anyways, definitely do not recommend voting election day. Uh, definitely don't recommend voting really late election day. Get it done 
quicker the better. Um, but yeah, I actually had a scare personally. Uh, I thought I spoiled my ballot at first, and I thought about it after, and I'm like, did I vote properly? And there was a good chance I didn't. I don't think I marked the ballot properly. But as I said before, I think it's because of my my election and politics participation is so much bigger than voting that literally like I almost you almost forget to vote like and I know that kind of encircles with people that are super politically engaged that it's like that is such a it's such a fraction of your involvement so yeah I, I'm almost certain I marked the ballot wrong and I cost my candidate one vote but yeah they weren't gonna win anyway so <laughs> Are they going to, like, kick you out of poli -Sci if they hear that you accidentally spoiled your ballot? I feel like that's, like, yeah, that's got to be. I can never volunteer for Elections Canada, uh, ever. <laughs> that's the first question on there. Have, do you know how to properly vote? And I, I won't even know how to fill that out, probably. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've definitely ruined my chance. Oh, yeah, so did either of you, I know you've made fun of me in the past for watching election results, but did either of you tune in? Uh, at all to anything online, social media, live streams, anything? I was like doing homework last night and I when I do homework I like to have something as background noise and I don't know what's more background noise than people talking about politics on CBC. Uh, so I turned that on and I didn't really listen. I saw like the little graphic that they put up when they were like the liberals are gonna form government and then the other graphic when they were like and it'll be a minority and then I was like oh so same thing, different year, cool, and then I turned it off. Yeah, I was watching baseball last night, so I had, I had like, uh, the odd tweet that would come up on my feed about it. I also did take a look at the, like, paint-by-numbers map of Canada, which is very, like, if you're, like, for an alien and you can see this map, it, it just looks very funny because, like, the Northwest Territories is, like, huge, and it's, like, I think it was orange or something, and, like, all the liberal red was, like, so minute, you'd think it would be, like, a blowout the other way, but the map was a little misleading, but... Uh, aside from that, I did not tune in. I love the like phrase "paint by numbers" map. I think that's fun. Uh, so I know that people were already pretty upset about having to vote this year, but I don't think us in Ontario, Ontario, uh, really understand how much we're going to be voting in the next two years. Uh, so now, within ooh, just over six months from now. We do have uh, municipal elections in June, so you vote for your your councillors and your uh, your mayor. Which I know, you know, if people don't pay attention to federal politics, they certainly aren't paying attention to local politics. So that should be fun. Uh, and then later in the summer, we have a provincial election, uh, which I know people generally are a little more uh, attuned to. So that might be a little bit higher engagement than the local election. But then, almost certainly. Within, within 12 months from then, we're going to be voting again federally because we have another minority. So I just want to know how excited you guys are to get to vote so many times in the next two years. Thrilled. Yeah, I, I, the, you mentioned the municipal elections. Um, yeah, I don't even know who else. I guess it would be different from us because we're all from different, we all have different mayors. But like for me in Toronto, like I don't even know who else would be up against John Tory. Like, good name a, a guy. I feel like the provincial election. Uh, is a little bit of a bigger deal, but um, yeah, also pretty much equally thrilled as Holly. Yeah, here in St. Catharines, the mayor is also definitely going to be uncontested, at least uncontested in a serious way. Uh, I think that's kind of the case that they see in a lot of places is that people are pretty well happy unless they do something just like morally reprehensible. There's just, there's no desire or interest or ability to care about local politics that closely to have like a tight race without you know for no reason okay uh so i'm going to be talking about an opinion article that i wrote this week um we're hitting it two weeks in a row with me talking about my own articles which is a little bit weird um i just talked about myself but yeah so i wrote an article about change your major uh, how it's not a super big deal, how it can be, you know, kind of scary to pick your major because, you know, you made a big choice. Everyone frames picking your major when you're, like, 17 as, like, the biggest choice you're going to make. Um, but I 
um, as these two, I'm sure, will make fun of me for at some point, have changed my major twice. It has made it so that I'm going to graduate a year later than I would have liked to, um, but I said in the article that's better than the alternative, uh, which is getting a degree that I'd never used and probably would have had to go back to school to get the degree that I'm getting right now anyway. Uh, so I just really wanted to sort of talk about my experience a little bit and then also reassure anyone who's questioning the choice that they made and the major that they have that, you know, go with your gut, switch it to something else, or, you know, if you were like, I just really hate university, dro there's no shame in dropping out, it's better than wasting your time and your money, in my opinion. It's obviously better to do it sooner than later, but like I said, I've done it twice. I changed my major from Dramatic Arts to English uh, halfway through my second year. And then halfway through my third year, I realized that I didn't like English all that much either. And I decided I was going to study sport management, which I think is maybe the first time in history anyone's ever done that. Um, so I think I might be the first person when they call my name at graduation. I'm like, I'm Holly Morrison graduating with a degree in sport management and a minor in English and dramatic arts. I think that's going to get a couple laughs. But yeah. So I guess I just wanted to, like, ask these two, because they have never changed their majors. They're both very solid and know what they want to do. Just, like, how and when did you pick your major? That was a little bit generous to say I know what I want to do. <laughs> I, I know that it's in a general area, in the vicinity of political science, uh, but there's definitely a lot of room for movement uh, in that, and it's changed pretty much every every year at the very least i mean probably not on a set schedule of every school year but at least once every year i've kind of shifted my focus in terms of what i'd like to pursue job wise uh but i've always kind of been grounded in the, the political science side since like 11th grade uh, i've been really big on this stuff uh, to a unhealthy degree <laughs> uh, before that though i was really tempted with psych uh, my sister had done a uh, psych minor, and so she kind of talked about it. She was uh, a couple years older than me, and she had talked about her courses a little bit and some of the more interesting stuff that she would learn uh, psych-based, and I was like, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. The first times I'm kind of becoming cognizant of the fact that I have to make this decision in, in two years. Uh, and so that was like kind of my first, not love, but just kind of like my first uh, thing I was committed to uh, before really hitting my stride with uh, political science. Yeah, I'm just, did you, were you into, like, high school council student politics? No, like, actual, no? Okay. <laughs> not like we're going to have, uh, like, free lunch and all that crap. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> uh, no, like Holly uh, alluded to, I'm also sport management uh, and, and have been since, I guess, first year. Um, this is my last year now, and, um, yeah, I've Pretty much, well, this is the only, Brocksport Management was the only only place I applied to, which uh, is not great, so I've been told, but I was I was pretty confident I'd get it. Now, the reputation aside, my marks were pretty good in high school. I, I felt pretty confident about sort of putting my eggs all in one basket, but like Noah, I also uh, don't like, don't really know what I want to do, but like I, I, I've always uh, liked sports and would uh, love to work in it, and um, yeah, pretty much, I guess, what precipitated uh, decision was when I was in high school I managed to do a, a co-op um, with Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment and I was 16 at the time so like also like Noah said grade 11 and uh, everyone I, I had interacted with there was like a Brock Schema alumni and I was like oh a lot of people have jobs with the Raptors and the Leafs that work and that came from this program maybe I should do that and obviously now how now that I'm almost done it uh, with my with my degree here, uh, definitely <laughs> would prefer to do something not businessy, which is like pretty much what the program is intended to. But I would definitely prefer to be on the creative side, which again doesn't really like fit in with what the program is about. Um, but yeah, I, I would uh, advise similar to what Holly said. Um, if, if the worst thing you could do is like suck out a four year degree of something you can never do, both my parents. Uh, have degrees that they have never used and now do things that are totally different from them. And my dad doubled down and then got his master's in the same, in English. He did an undergrad English, then my dad got a master's in English and now does nothing, nothing related to it and, like, basically hates himself every day for it. Only a little bit. Um, so if, now if, he works in French. <laughs> now he, he only works in French now, not knowing. 
yeah, no, he just does retail and like business stuff. But um, yeah, I, I definitely uh, I agree that if you want to make a switch, you should do it sooner rather than later. Yeah, for sure. I don't like because I picked my major when I was sixteen years old, I think. Uh, Because I have a late birthday, so I would have been 16, and that would have been the beginning of... I I would have been 15, actually, beginning of my grade 11 year was when they asked us to start thinking about it. Um, And at that point, I was like, high school theater kid all the way. I'm going to do theater for the rest of my life. I'm going to change the world with art. Um, And you can probably tell by the tone of my voice that I kind of hate that now. Um, Doing theater school really did not do much to encourage my enjoyment of theater. Um, So I, like hated it I like hated going to class every day and I get it like class sucks sometimes but if you hate going to every single one of your classes for the love of god like change your major because clearly something's wrong um yeah so like I mentioned I picked my major when I was a very young teenager um so I guess I just wanted to ask broadly do you think that it's a good idea that you have to decide essentially that what guidance counselors are telling you, or at least in my experience in high school, that you've got to decide what you want to be and what you want to do forever when you're, like, 17 years old? Do you think that's, like, the right way to frame that decision? Yes and no. I I think it's a little hyperbolic sometimes how people talk about this issue. Uh, kind of the same way I think about when people talk about, like, standardized testing, and I'm doing air quotes, which you can't see, uh, and how, like, not everyone tests the same. Like, yeah, we get it. Like, it's true, but, like, there is some reason why we've been testing this way for so many years. Like, there, there is some reason for trying to prepare people at that certain age uh, to become uh, a professional, or at least to kind of guide your life in a way to prepare to become a professional in something that, uh, you know, whether it matters to you or not, is something you might be able to be proud in, uh, proud of the work that you do. And, um, yeah, so... Uh, I do think it is important to start thinking about that. I, I don't necessarily think the age is... Like it, it's, it's young. I mean, we, we do get that, and I, I think we can all agree on that. Uh, but I think it's kind of necessary to start dropping those seeds, because, look, it, it certainly didn't inhibit my ability to, ability to have a lot of fun in the rest of high school, because we had a, a careers class in grade 10, right? Like, it, it didn't, like, traumatize me. Uh, I, I mean, I guess some people's experiences could definitely be different with that, but I think... You know, there's no better time to start, I guess, than when you, people are still, um, you know, being taught every day for, for eight hours or so, something around there, around eight hours a day. Uh, you know, it might as well be the time to start laying those seeds because then maybe you can, you know, encourage good habits uh, going forward. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I didn't really... Like, I wouldn't have done it differently, like the way I ended up at Brock, I don't think there was another way I could have done it, because when I was 17, I had no idea that sport management was a field that existed, and something that I could do, and the only reason that I figured that out is because I was a dramatic arts major, and because I (laughs) didn't like my classes so much that I skipped them a lot to go to games for this job, actually. Um, Don't tell my... I tell my teachers, I don't actually care. (laughs) Um what they think anymore but yeah so I think 17 is like you know you're still a kid but you're also like about to not be a kid anymore you kind of got to figure out what you're doing I know my sister is she's 18 uh and she's not in school right now um I think it's honestly because I traumatized her because she watched me change majors twice and she's like I don't want to waste money like you did um that's like I think the only thing for me where I'm like maybe it's like a hard decision to make someone to like essentially ask someone to make at that age because you are talking about like tens of thousands of dollars that you're going to be spending that's my only thing but yeah i think it's not the worst to have to do that as a teenager yeah exactly like holly's sister is doing you could also just if you don't know i guess a gap year is something that a lot of uh 18 year olds do and will continue to do and it's also if you don't know probably a good decision um i also have a sibling who is 18 and he is in his first year of uh university this year um but i know a lot of people who uh took a gap year and i guess you know they'll be a year behind but it's it's worth it if uh that year allows you to sort of figure out what you were 
what you want to do. I know for me, I was not about to do a gap year because I, at 17 and still now at 21, wanted to finish school as quick as possible. Um, so that was really never in the cards for me. Um, but it's definitely better to be safe, take the year off, than, you know, waste many, many thousands of dollars. Yeah, that's, I think, what it comes down to is, like, the faster you can make the decision, the better it's going to be for your bank account. But also, if you don't make that decision right away, if you, like me, messed up and picked something when you were 17 that didn't end up working out, just change it now, because that's, you're still, you know, saving a little bit more money in the long run, because you don't want a degree that you're not going to use. Yeah, I think making that, uh, making that decision when it starts to come up in your head, I think is important. <laughs> the one thing to have some, some occasional or residual, not residual, occasional doubt, but something that is residual, uh, ongoing, uh, doesn't, just kind of is always there. You really should listen to that sooner than later because it's going to save you money, right? If you're, uh, if that is the concern, which I obviously it is for for most people, myself included. If I was interested, if I was looking at changing a major now, it's it's really too late for me. I'm <laughs> with two credits left. To be quite honest, I'd rather just get the degree. Uh, which kind of brings me to another point. So Holly, you mentioned about dropping out, which I can agree with if you're within the first half of your degree. Uh, or not even your degree, within the first half of getting a degree. But if you've hit that halfway point, in my personal opinion, I do think you should at least sw either switch majors or just really tough it out because the value of a university degree, I think, is kind of uh, just, it really can't be matched. I, I mean, the, the statistic the statistics bear it out that you generally do better uh, in terms of you know, job performance and your, your salary expectations, just across the whole career, uh, whether you, you use the degree as we talked about or not, uh, if you're over, if you're over the hump on it, you're like, you're over halfway there. I would not recommend someone dropping out, but that's personal. I mean, people's circumstances are different. Some might require that, but if it's really just a personal preference issue, I think it's worth getting the degree personally, but I'd love to hear other thoughts on that. Yeah. I don't know. I have like a policy in, I guess my own life, um, is just like, if you're doing something and it makes you more miserable than it's worth, um, just stop, and that's fine, and that's okay, and you'll, you'll survive. Obviously, like, if you, it's like, it's a huge decision to make about whether to drop out, um, I think bigger than deciding what your major's gonna be, especially when you already have credits, like, you paid for those, um, they're not really worth all that much unless you've got all of them together to make a degree. It's like a collectible set. <laughs> Don't have, like, all the baseball cards. They're not worth any money yet. But yeah, I think, like, if you can bear it, try to coast to the end. Take those easy classes. Um, get the requirements. Take the easiest electives you can. Um, but yeah, I guess I like to reduce the amount of misery in my life. And for me, changing my major did that. For some people, um, hitting the road might do that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I wouldn't, yeah, I, I wasn't trying to say just to, like, follow it through as it as you laid it out in before you went in, even into university, right, and, and try to hit that goal, right? There's nothing wrong with reorienting and switching things, but, like, someone in their third year, for example, of a university degree uh, to drop out, I think does not make sense because the big thing there is that you have past degrees. You have three year past degrees. Uh, and so really you should be looking at, okay, how can I reorient this that I might have to do one more semester and I can walk out of here with this past degree. Cause like we were just saying with, if you, if you at least can walk out with that, that's certainly better than just a disparate kind of collection of, your, of credits you finish that you don't get a piece of paper for, right? You might as well get the piece of paper for it. So that's more what I was trying to say is that at least understanding like what's, if it's not working out, like what's maybe my quickest route to walking out of here with a piece of paper. Piece of paper is the most expensive wall art I'm ever going to own. Um, yeah, I really marked that one up on myself. Um, but yeah, unless anybody else has anything that they want to add, I just use like an interview phrase there. That's <laughs> if I'm interviewing something, someone I'm always like, anything else you want to add? Ooh, journalism, peel back the curtain there. Um, 
But yeah, so that's all I've got about my article. So now I think Jonah's going to talk about a collection of articles that we had this week. Uh, So toss it over to you. All right, and our final batch of articles that we're going to touch on um, sort of all tie together. They all have sort of a similar theme, and that theme is pandemic fatigue. Uh, several articles sort of touched on it, both uh, just in broad terms and in getting into the specifics, one of which was another uh, opinion piece that Holly wrote about um, a mass email that all the Brock students got about uh, some off-campus partying, and Holly's, I, well, she'll talk about it a little bit more, but pretty much the, uh, you know, the thesis behind that article was there's a lot of mixed messages about what we can and can't do um, with regards to back to school. And so with that in mind, would you like to take us behind the curtain? Behind the curtain, I guess. Yeah, so um, I'm going to tell Noah to stop putting all my articles in here because it makes me look very vain. Um, But yeah, I wrote an opinion piece. We basically got an email from one of like the admin at Brock that said, hey, stop partying. People are getting arrested. It's bad to party during a pandemic. And my article does not say that you should party. Please don't go to a massive party. Don't, like, pack into a basement. Um, But I also wrote about, like, I can understand why someone might come to the conclusion that it's okay to go to a party because we've been told for, like, almost a year now that the key to getting back to normal is to get your vaccine and that when we're all in a big lecture hall with hundreds of other people, the vaccine and wearing a mask keeps you safe. So... I can understand why someone might go, ah, if it keeps me safe in a lecture hall, why wouldn't it keep me safe in, you know, a party? Um, So I wrote a little bit about that, how it's kind of a mixed message, how obviously don't go to these big parties, but also, like, universities need to do better about sort of saying that it's okay to do, like, things that are labor-related, all your work in school, but it's not okay to do things that are leisure-related. So I wrote about that, and then I also wrote about the first day back to school, all of the things that went into that. Um, It was a lot of hard work from a lot of people, um, and then also just generally wrote about how the thing that people are most happy to get back is just not being isolated anymore. Um, I interviewed, I want to say, like, half a dozen people, and I asked them all the same question, and I was like, what's one thing that you really missed about being on campus that you're glad you have back now? And there's not a single person who gave an answer other than I'm happy to just see friends and acquaintances. I'm happy to just have those conversations. And I think that does tie into pandemic fatigue because we haven't seen people in forever. Um, It's hard to have an acquaintance through Zoom. You can talk to your best friends, but you can't really talk to, like, just some pals. Um, So that's what I wrote about really ties into pandemic fatigue, I think. Um, Yeah. My, my thoughts on it are kind of, are definitely similar. Uh, I think there's a lot of moralizing on pandemic stuff, because I think, at least Jonah mentioned, it might have been you as well, Holly, uh, of things that you can and can't do. But it's during the pandemic, which has been the case, like with different lockdown restrictions and stuff, and still kind of is the case, because there's still some minor uh, restricted things left uh, to, to kind of cross off the list. But... I think the bigger thing is like what you should and shouldn't do is kind of the form it takes, right? There's a lot of moralizing. uh, And when it's coming, pretty much any source that engages in, you know, moralizing or finger pointing, we know the, it's it's a stupid corny saying, but you know, you you point one finger and then there's three pointed back at yourself. Like, it's true. It's, it's a, that's a saying because it's totally true. there's so much moralizing from people who are obviously breaking the rules for their own uh, exceptions because we all have our own personal exceptions that we think are okay because we're doing it and we're not going to get people sick because why we don't want to do that, but those people want to, right? So there's, yeah, th- that kind of like hypocritical moralizing, especially from the university, not just Brock, but I mean, any universities that are having uh, on-campus stuff going on and uh, they're packing in their residence buildings again because they're happy to take your money for that. Uh, and then to, to put all the onus on students partying, it's like, yeah, they are partying unsafely. I agree with Holly. Not a good idea to be going to these gigantic parties. Uh, all A bunch of, uh, you know, the those clubs and, like, bars downtown and stuff, they're, like, um, they've been getting hit with some fines and things like that. So, uh 
yeah, I mean, there is there is unsafe activity you can be engaging right now that probably isn't smart. Uh, but to to have the university putting that whole onus on students to me rubbed me the wrong way too. So I, I do agree with Holly there. Yeah, I also um, I guess the difference from I guess a school's perspective between a lecture hall and a party would be in a lecture hall you're I don't know what is it three feet between chairs depending I don't know you have all the masks on it's a pretty it's like everyone's still whereas a party you could be like on top of each other in a tight 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 quarters um, but then there's also intramurals that are going on and there's like indoor basketball which is like seems to me the worst thing for COVID because you're indoors and literally sweating on top of each other and breathing heavily. So I really don't see how the intramurals are safe or safer, I should say. Like, let's be honest, I'll probably still play them because they're being offered and I'll follow whatever protocols they have. Um, but yeah, similar sentiments to what Noah and Holly had said. Um, just the mixed messaging seems to be a bit a rub, rub, rub people the wrong way only if uh, you know, it seems to be work first and then everything else second. Yeah, I think sort of just like as the pandemic has gone on, like I'm obviously I'm still following the rules. I'm not going to not follow the rules because it's kind of just easier to follow the rules. But a lot of the time when I like see rules, it's like this doesn't make a whole lot of sense anymore. Um, I don't get like the things where it's like, you can go to a restaurant, you have to wear your mask, but you can take it off when you're sitting down because definitely, like, the virus knows the difference. It's that kind of thing where I can understand why that might make people, like, really tired of being told what to do, and it just, like, I get it. Um, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's... Some of those rules, when they when they come down to it, are just kind of silliness. Uh, and I think the bigger thing than the lecture halls would be the res residence buildings. <laughs> Having those pack like sardines uh, is clearly uh, against a lot of these, you know, recommendations. and clearly poses a massive risk for things to be coming in because we know people go home, I mean, if they're close, almost every weekend. Uh, people go home every other weekend, every couple weekends. Uh, students will go back home, uh, especially, you know, now I'm sure there's a lot of more kind of issues with separation than leaving home after 18 months of being stuck at home, right? So uh, just the, the risk of transmission there, like if we're trying to talk seriously about it and trying to say that every, you know, rule is fully justified and logically thought out, that one to me does not make a lot of sense, right? Uh, so then to have people just going straight for the jugular for people who are, you know, letting loose and making that personal decision of, you know, this to me, you know, I've, I've considered the risk, you know, because to some degree you have to consider, you can't ignore the fact that COVID's going on. You're not going to forget that. Uh, but at, at some level in your brain, you've made that decision. Like, yes, I'm taking on this risk, no matter how large it might be. Uh, I definitely, again, I would not recommend people be breaking rules. I'm just not interested in kind of the this moralizing argument this late in the game when we have so many contradictory things going on it's just I, I'm clearly I'm pandemic fatigued if you couldn't tell uh, and I'm not again I'm not someone personally interested in uh, going to a mass huge massive place with my mask off to spit on people and have them spit on me like I it just it, that does freak me out personally and kind of grosses me out before pandemic and now too but like yeah I, I just I don't like how it's kind of being framed against just specific people when it's convenient and not others and not other organizations when it's not convenient for them. Yeah, I, Noah's restaurant thing sort of alerted me to, uh, I guess, what's happening with all the sport events and, like, the weirdest, most insane rule to me. And I get, I get why they have to do it, just, like, for uh, risk management's sake. But um, the rule that's, like, you have to wear your mask uh, at all times unless you're eating and drinking. Well, I could buy a bag of popcorn in the first inning and nurse it until the sixth inning, and then I have my mask off the whole time because I'm technically eating. So that one always seemed to be, uh, you know, not the most foolproof. But um, yeah, a lot of I think, like Noah was saying, more so than anything, those ones are the ones that make you just go like, "Oh my god, really?" More than anything else. And I definitely remember uh, just like going into restaurants with my mask on for five seconds and then coming outside and taking it off. Like that 
seems a little redundant, but yeah, I think um, all of our articles uh, this week, um, well, not all, but quite a number of them sort of uh, reference this idea of pandemic fatigue in them. I guess that's why we brought it on the podcast. All right, that does it for another episode of The Latest. Thank you, Holly and Jonah, for joining me to talk about these uh, very interesting topics. Some more than others, obviously, the election being the least of, <laughs> least of which, but had to talk about it, you know. Uh, but yeah, and thank you all for listening as well. We really appreciate it. Uh, remember that you can find the full articles we talked about here today and many, many more by going to our website, www.brockpress.com. You can also find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn at the Brock Press. Uh, on top of following us on social media, be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Find us on Anchor.fm, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, and Spotify. Just be sure to look up the latest The Brock Press Podcast and you should find us no problem. Uh, you can also find the podcast on our YouTube channel and on our website. With all that said, thanks again and we'll see you next week for another episode.